In this section, I will talk about serverless distributed data management patterns and how you can implement them. When you use a Lambda function, your microservices will be stateless, which allows you to easily scale out and is generally best practice. The state, however, needs to be maintained outside the Lambda, so this could be as an event or in a database, which is what we are going to talk about in this section. In this section, we're going to look at implementing database per service and shared database patterns, accessing DynamoDB from API Gateway via a Lambda function, accessing DynamoDB directly from API Gateway, implementing the transaction log training pattern, implementing the Saga pattern, and securing your DynamoDB data store. Welcome to this video, which talks about database per service and shared database patterns. In this video, we're going to take a look at the CAP theorem, shared database pattern, the database per service pattern, and some of the AWS databases that are available and supported by AWS. First, the CAP theorem. CAP theorem stands for Consistency, Availability, and Partition Tolerance. In the year 2000, Eric Brewer proposed the CAP theorem for distributed data stores. It's broken down into three different types of guarantees. Consistency, which means that if you write something to one node, you will get the same data on another word. Otherwise, you will get an error. Availability, which means that if you query a node, it will respond, even if the data is not most up to date. Partition tolerance, which means that data or messages can freely within the network between nodes, despite having any network failure, for example, or any delays or drops in the actual data. It has been shown mathematically that you can only have two of the three of these at most. I cannot have all three, as it is, after all, a distributed system, which depends heavily on the network availability. So that's the interconnectivity between the nodes. So here we have four nodes that are all connected together. Usually people adopt CP or AP. So remember, C is the consistent C, P is the partition tolerance, and AP is the availability and the partition tolerance. So some services can actually be CP and others can be AP within one system. It really depends on the use cases. So for example, you might want a customer loyalty point balance to be AP or eventually consistent for scalability. But a bank may want their customer bank balance to be always up to date. That is to reflect how much they can actually withdraw. So they might choose a CP model instead which has strong consistency and may return something like, sorry, we're not able to access your details at the moment. If there's any availability issue, for example. Some databases such as Amazon DynamoDB allow you to choose between the strong or the eventual consistency reads at table level, giving you that flexibility that we just discussed. Shared database. The most common pattern is to have a shared database used by different services where we have a service for customer orders, customer support and customer details in this example that all share a single database. The benefits are that it is simple to understand and all the data is in one place. SQL is really efficient at doing join or group by queries, for example, on this shared data customer store efficiently. The main drawback is that you bind these services to the same database, making it tightly coupled. So any changes in schema, for example, may break the other services. So it will require extensive regression testing to make sure all the services are still working as expected. The second drawback is that the database will use a specific technology stack and may not be able to scale out depending on the service requirements. Another drawback is that you now need to potentially update several services 
if any of the business logic changes. So it's low cohesion, which is something we generally prefer to avoid. Database per service pattern. So one database per service allows each microservice to choose their own technology stack for the database, which is not possible with the shared database pattern we just described earlier. The developers have the freedom in terms of the schema and can tailor it based on their domain expertise. So rather than having to, for example, align it with the organizational structure or the data architecture of the whole enterprise, which can be good or can be bad. So it really depends on the company and the choices. The drawbacks of using a database per service is that it can lead to a fragmentation or data islands. For example, if you want to join or query across different databases or different tables, this can be slow if we have to go via the microservice REST APIs. And that's the pattern which we call API composition, which allows you to, for example, query all three data stores, again, by invoking the three of the APIs in this case. So something like that was very easy to do in the shared database where we could just write join query in SQL that would query the three different tables in the same database. In this example, you would have to join in memory by calling three APIs. So that would be to join the customer order, the customer support and the customer details, which does work. But imagine you have almost 10 different tables that you want to join and check. This will obviously have an impact on performance and also on the latency especially when compared to the database joins, which are highly optimized and are purpose built for that. I've also seen scenarios where having each team choose the database schema can lead to big inconsistencies in naming conventions and inefficiencies in data storage, which can impact scalability comprehension for anybody reading those tables outside the team. So then what happens is other teams such as the BI teams or database teams need to actually almost run some heavy ETL on that data to transform it and normalize it almost. So Amazon DynamoDB is essentially a fast, fully managed NoSQL database service. So it does not provide SQL, but has its own more restrictive query language, which is based on partition and sort keys. It allows you to write queries that are highly efficient, really fast, and DynamoDB is very durable and highly available. It also supports in-memory caching via a managed service called DAX, which reduces the DynamoDB response time from milliseconds to microseconds. And you can think of it as similar to Redis or Memcache. So it's simple and cost-effective as you pay per storage and provision reads and writes as you desire and based on your application. Or you can actually choose even an auto scaling option where those are actually determined based on the request that your services get. It is serverless in that you don't need to do any administrative tasks like choosing instance types, upgrading, patching, and backups. Amazon Relational Database Service, RDS, is a managed database service in AWS where AWS handles the administrative tasks, such as upgrades, patching, and backups. And it allows you to resize the instances and choose the disk size. The good thing is that it supports multiple database engines, such as Oracle, MySQL, SQL Server, etc., Allowing you to migrate your on-premise database if you need to, for example, and they have various tools to do that. It is also highly durable as an option, and that's available. The other one that a lot of people are excited about is Amazon Aurora, which offers five times the query performance of MySQL in RDS. It's a relational database built for the cloud with dynamic storage resizing up to 64 terabytes. It's highly available, durable, and scalable using SSDs, fault tolerant self-healing, and which auto recovers from the crashes. It supports up to 15 distributed read replicas, allowing you to easily scale out to support a huge number of transactions per second. It is one of the fastest growing services in AWS in history, 
and developers love it as you don't need to change semantics or rewrite your applications for high performance. And with the new multi-master option, they also get fast writes as well as the reads via the read replicas. So RDS and Aurora still rely on you creating and configuring instances, choosing the sizes, scheduling the backup windows. So it would be great to have something a bit like DynamoDB, which is always on and you pay per requests and is serverless. So the answer is Amazon Aurora serverless, where there is no need to manage any database instances or clusters like with RDS or Aurora, making it fully managed and serverless. So you can think of it as similar to DynamoDB in terms of auto scaling of instances, storage and memory, which is great if workloads are unpredictable or say variable. The cost is actually based on the storage and resources you actually consume right down to the second. It's fully managed in that you don't need to actually select any instances and capacity and is highly available at over 99.99%. And I think that comes from the fault tolerance that's actually built into the cluster, which is distributed as six way replicas. At the time of speaking, Amazon Aurora Serverless is still in preview, but we will show you how to connect to RDS, MySQL and Aurora from a Lambda function. And essentially it's remaining with that compatibility with MySQL and Postgres. So the connection will be identical and that should just work across Aurora and Aurora Serverless.